Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pub. My name is Rick Archer and my guest this week is Gary Crowley. And uh, Gary was referred to me by his publisher, just as Chuck Hillig was, same publisher, Connie Shaw, Sentient Publications, because he has a book and he's written a couple of books. Uh, this one's called Past the Jelly, Tales of Ordinary Enlightenment. And I must say, Gary, I really enjoyed this book. Um, oh, good. I, I read it a month or two ago when you first sent it to me, and I laughed, you know, <laughs> uh, many pages I was laughing out loud. Good. And um, I started reading it again yesterday just to sort of refresh my memory of what you said, and I started laughing again. I, I've just gotten <laughs> to the point where your brother was picking you up at the uh, car repair shop, and uh -huh. that, that guy was chasing him around <laughs> trying to beat him up. <laughs> it was very funny. People doing what they do, yes. Yeah. So, but um, you can, uh, you know, recapitulate what's in the book during this interview because I, I forget the details and most of our listeners <coughs> won't have read it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've written another book, have you? Uh, yes, I wrote a book called From Here to Here, Turning Toward Enlightenment. Good. So we'll talk and, about that one, too. Okay. Uh, and whatever else you want to talk about. And um, one, th one thing that struck me as I read the book, aside from the fact that you're a very funny guy and a good writer, was I thought, well... You know, was he really this precocious and articulate as a 12-year-old, or is he kind of transposing his current level of maturity, you know, as a 30-something back to when he was 12? And, you know, because, I mean, when I was 12, I wasn't anywhere near that articulate as, you know, some of the things you were saying to your father or your teachers or mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. like that. I mean, is, what's the story on that? Um, I think I, what I tried to convey uh -huh. was... Um, was a a level of of curiosity uh, of a child mm -hmm. uh, without necessarily the depth of understanding that you would have as an adult. Now, and I am writing as an adult, right? But you know, the, in a, in a certain way, the the questions and precocious things I bring bring up in the book, they're 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 meant to be asked more from a you know kind of a child's sim simple understanding, uh -huh. while at the same time pointing out that. Well, in some ways, it kind of is that simple. Yeah, um, but, yeah. But, but but definitely, I'm not meaning to imply that, you know, I had the perspective then that I have now. Yeah, um, I think Christ said something like, except you be as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, just kind of an innocence, objective observation of, like, you know, my... The title of the book is Pass the Jelly, and right. that comes after watching my dad read the newspaper at my kitchen breakfast table for 12 years, where he's constantly surprised at all the same stuff happening in the world. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, so this is the same stuff happening all the time. Why are you so surprised? You know, the the politics kind of, this is all, it's a repeat of that. And, you know, the yes, the, the Palestinians and the Israelis aren't getting along. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I mean, there's all of these things that I, you know, and I think, you know, as a child, just that kind of, what's so surprising is, is more like, is, it was the intention. And, but again, it's a simple truth that translates to even in your adult perspective on things. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, people do what they do. Um, <laughs> yes. It's very, very Byron Katie-ish. Um, yes, yes. And, and, and my previous book, From Here to Here, talks um, in, a, in a very precise and concise manner, uh, basically shows people how their brain works and why we have this illusion that we're consciously, you know, controlling and willing how we are all the time, but... Really, if you step back and look a little, and even with a little uh, kind of layman-friendly science, you can see that, well, mostly, you know, we're handed the decisions that we become conscious of, mm -hmm. and that's why we're kind of basically the same person we were the day before. Uh, we're not getting up and trying to recreate ourselves every morning. It's mostly these patterns that kind of repeat themselves. Yeah, a couple of Paul Simon songs come to mind. Uh, <laughs> still crazy after all these years, and... Uh, <laughs> That line from the boxer, after changes upon changes, we are more or less the same. <laughs> I, uh, I love that line. I heard that after, I, you know, I'd heard the song before, but I heard that line after I'd written both these books recently, uh, and I was kind of like, oh, I really, I, I like that line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we do, and what I, you know, a lot of people, when they read from here to here especially, because um, Kafka said that a, a book should be an ice axe that breaks the frozen illusions within us. Mm -hmm. And from here to here is definitely intended to be an ice axe mm -hmm. about your breaking through your illusions of all this conscious will and conscious control that we assume we have. 
But people, Jen, a lot of people will, will ask me after they read from here to here especially, you know, so what, people can't change? And I say throughout the book numerous times, people can change with new conditioning, but mm -hmm. it has to be of the right type and at the right time and of the right intensity. But, you know, if we could all just will our changes that we want, well, the world would be a very different place. You know, we'd be one-time learners, and, you know, we'd all be walking around being exactly the ways we've consciously chosen to be. Mm -hmm. And um, so so I, I, I just, from here to here and past the jelly are, are past the jelly in a very funny way, are meant to allow people to have a lot more compassion for themselves and other people as they move through the world going, yeah, if they, you know, Obviously, if they could kind of work their way out of that, they probably would have by now. <laughs> yeah. Because huh. <laughs> everyone can see it's not working. Um, so I'll have to read from here to here, too. I think I must have told you not to send me too many books because I don't want to take advantage of people and, and have them send me books I don't have a chance to read. But I enjoyed this one so much that if you feel like sending the other one, I'll read that, too. I certainly will. I certainly will. <laughs> yeah. I told that to Chuck Hillig also. I said, don't send me a whole lot of books because I don't want to, you know, I, I, it takes me months to get through a book sometimes, you know, because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm busy mm -hmm. and I, I, I do a lot of stuff electronically instead of by reading. But mm -hmm. uh, but I uh, I think he sent me one of his books. Yeah, I did, he did send me one of his books, which I enjoyed very much too. I guess you yeah. know Chuck. I think he recommends yeah, he put a book little, on the back here. Yeah, he put a very nice blurb on the on the back of my book, which yeah. I appreciate. Um, so... So that's that. Actually, what you just said gives me a, a little bit better understanding of um, what you actually were saying in this book, because um, it's like people do change, but you just you don't go from zero to sixty in, in you know one second. You, you the change is more incremental. It's like well, well, actually, what was it, Chuck? Yeah, it was Chuck. He he. Uh, he took this the, the the old nursery rhyme row 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 your boat and did a very nice rendition of it you know in which you know you're 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 flowing down the stream so you you, you can't help but go with the flow i mean the river is carrying mm -hmm. you along but there is a little bit of volition you know it's row 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 so you're taking some action and you're basically mm -hmm. going where the river wants you to go cuz you really don't have any choice but you can wiggle your boat around this way and that and maybe keep it from running into some branches or you know you have some some control right and 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 my point uh, i guess in both my books is that but the the it's also i think important to note that that you don't consciously control your desire arising to do certain things. So if you are fortunate enough to, for the desire to rise within you to change in ways that make your life better, then fantastic. But some people take more, unfortunately, pain and suffering or more experience, if nothing else, to to get to that place where they finally go, oh, you know, this, this isn't working. I'm going to seek change. And then since you can't, you don't consciously will the, the desire to change nor the actual change itself, I liken... Um, I didn't know about Chuck's row, row, row your boat, but I like boats too. So um, I often liken change to, to going fishing, where once you decide you're going to pursue change, um, it's, a, it's a lot like having to cast out that, that line, and some baits don't work, so you try that for a while, and then you switch it up, and maybe you go to a different spot, and, you, and then finally, if you're fortunate, you, you get the change you want. But it's, if we could, again, if we could just consciously will it, the world would be a very different place, and um, so I, again, I have a lot of compassion for people who are most people are mostly doing the best they can. Yeah. Well, <laughs> th there's an old saying, which is that to which you give your attention grows stronger in your life. So mm -hmm. you know you're not going to become a different person overnight, but you do tend to, you know, the more you give your attention to something, the more you're going to enliven that impression or that tendency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I drink a, you know, pint of whiskey every day. It's mm -hmm. going, I'm going to become an alcoholic, you know, but, <laughs> but I don't have that in, you know, I don't have that inclination to begin with. So it's sort of right. like, you know, and then, but again, not just to, to point out other little nuances, but there's also people who suddenly do make drastic changes. It's true. And, you know, like, you know, in Chuck's example, you run into a sandbar yeah. in your boat and, and then suddenly things have changed. I, I knew a, a guy, I almost put him in my book, mm -hmm. past the jelly, uh, Growing up, he was an old World War II Navy vet, mm -hmm. very, very prideful man. But he, he smoked three packs of cigarettes a day for 35, 40 years. And he had, he had tried to quit a few times, I think, and mm -hmm. hadn't succeeded. And then one day on April Fool's Day, uh, one of his friends asked him for a cigarette. 
And he said, oh, I don't have any. I, I quit smoking. Huh. And, he, and his friend laughed in his face uh -huh. and told him he could never quit smoking. Uh. And he looked back at his friend and he said, I just did. Uh. And he never smoked again. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even difficult because wow. his, his pride yeah. ranked so much higher than smoking that it was almost effortless. He was Interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. So yeah. anyway, so that's when you're blessed with those moments, that's nice too. And also, you know, I mean, not only in terms of behavioral things, but in terms of uh, spiritual, the spiritual dimension, so to speak, sometimes people have these radical sudden awakenings out of the blue, like speaking of Byron Katie, as we did a few minutes ago, she had mm -hmm. one, you know, sitting there in a halfway house, cockroach <laughs> crawls across her feet, foot, and in all of a sudden, Barstow. kaboom, yeah, in yeah, Barstow. Barstow. Less. <laughs> yeah. Or, by, or Eckhart Tolle, same thing, you know, he was on the verge of suicide, he, he said, I can't live with myself anymore, then he says to himself, you know, oh, wait a minute, who is this self with whom I can't live? Are there two of me? And he, he goes to bed, wakes up awake, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it happens. And, yeah, and I do think without uh, giving away, you know, certain parts of my book, I do think there are situations where when sometimes when they're dramatic enough, that's what it takes to to get that insight. Yeah. And then it's oh, great. You can give them away. People will buy it anyway. <laughs> Well, that's the last chapter. I don't oh, want to okay, give that yeah. <laughs> Actually, speaking of the last chapter, you know, I have to, again, I have to reread the book. But somehow uh, when I got to the end of the book, I, in fact, I, 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 there was a whole thing at the end of the book about you, your friends chiding you because you wouldn't r wear your bicycle helmet or something like that. And, and well, that's I, throughout the whole book. Oh, throughout yeah. the whole book. In fact, I, I hadn't heard from you for a while. When, when I, I was wondering, are we going to do this interview or not? And I sent you an email. I didn't hear. I thought, oh, my God, maybe he took a bike ride without his helmet. And, you know, <laughs> he's not around anymore or something. Uh, but we all grew up not wearing our helmets. It's and true. We, I mean, I did crazy somehow, stuff. And I, like I, I say in the book, you know, I spent most of my youth trying to injure myself on my bicycle. Yeah. With no off ramps and stuff like that. And, yeah. Poorly constructed ramps at that, you know. <laughs> yeah. And we'd jump over our friends because mm -hmm. Evil Knievel was the was right. the hero of the day, and uh, somehow we all survived. And but that's not what we do anymore. Right. Now everybody puts on a helmet, except for me. And statistically, we're probably better off wearing them. I mean, you know, fewer people get killed in today's cars than in the old Corvairs, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and and today people are on their cell phones and, you know, a woman almost ran me over while she was texting the other day driving. So yeah. people weren't texting. <laughs> right. Uh, Oprah's on a big campaign against that. Oh, yes. Oh. And, you know, she was she was swerving pretty, yeah. pretty well down the road. They say it's worse than being drunk. <clears throat> but in any case, uh, without giving away the, the, the suspenseful end of your book, um, uh -huh. so... And, and actually, I was just reading your website here, and, and uh, you were saying, uh, you know, that you had gone. So let's get into this a little bit. You said you, you went through, a, you were attracted to Eastern philosophy and spiritual writings um, uh -huh. at, at a young age. Um, kind of recap that. What did you get into, and what did you pursue, and so on? And, and to make a long story short, you finally gave it all up. But let's talk about it before we get to the point where you gave it all up. Well, I, I went to, you know, I, you know, the, the Hindu Buddhisty kind of stuff. Uh, appeal to me and mm -hmm. the Taoist stuff especially the the Tao Te Ching and mm -hmm. depending on the translations you read and you know I'd bounce around to I love Rumi I love Hafiz and you know kind of any mystic out there was right. appealing to me and I studied with uh, guys like Jack Schwartz I don't know if you've ever heard of him out in Oregon uh, I don't think Jack's actually with us anymore there was but, a James uh, Schwartz that I interviewed not so long ago who's very no, much different with different, different uh, Schwartz okay yeah, and uh, and I and Jack was a he was in a Nazi concentration camp for oh. four years, and he was an incredible guy, but kind yeah. of a uh, kind of the a, a Deepak Chopra way back in the '60s. Yeah, and uh, and but so I was I was very attracted to that. Did my you know meditating, did all sorts of different things, and um, you know I tended to do things um, pretty intensely, mm -hmm. and when I would not seem to get much traction from them after a while, I'd go try other things. And then after uh, 20 years or so of, of doing this, I I finally just said, okay, well, you know, if, if efforting at all this stuff was the way to get somewhere, it probably would have worked by now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I basically just let go. Mm -hmm. And about, I, you know, and just went out with my life and went surfing a lot or whatever I was doing and fixing people's bodies that I do during the day. Mm -hmm. And then... Just because I wanted to, I I went back to my bookshelf and I started reading uh, Wei Wu Wei, who mm -hmm. I've 
always is far and away my favorite author. Hmm. And he has eight books. And I would just read them every morning for an hour, hour and a half or two. And uh, and when I would f- finish the last book, I just would start the first one again. And huh. I would just read them. And, and, um, and then at some point, uh, about after about a year or, or more of doing this, I uh, probably about a year of doing it. I so I'm two years of of not caring, and I'm just reading way 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 because I enjoy it, mm-hmm. and I feel like for some reason, even though he's very enigmatic for a lot of people, I just feel like he's sitting across from the table talking to me. Mm-hmm. And so I he's uh, he has a book called All Else Is Bondage, mm-hmm. and there was a footnote in that book that um, I'd probably read thirty times, but on this one day, I read this this footnote that said. Uh, Free, we are not the number one, the first of all our objects, but zero, their universal and absolute subject. And there was a, I mean, I, a palpable shift in me as when I did that, and I went, oh, huh. well, that's easy. Huh. And so, literally, it's one of those moments where before and after, you know, yeah. it's kind of a defining thing in life. And since literally then... Things have, you know, been substantially different in the way I look at things. Interesting. Um, I have a couple of comments on that for what they're worth. Um, one is it's, it's hard to assign cause and effect with this stuff. I mean, absolutely. It very well may be that those <laughs> 20 years or whatever of, of practice and meditation and stuff that you did were very effective. And, totally agree. Um, yeah, you know, and uh, you know, things might not have turned out the same if you, if you hadn't done it. It's it's all very speculative, and it's also you know very mu- it may very well be that giving it all up was very effective, you know, and that that, that sort of relaxing of, of the whole thing uh, was an important, was just as important as doing the stuff. Oh, well, I think they all were. All those steps were. I completely, yeah. I completely agree. And, and I, 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 I just, like uh, it. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I liken it uh, over the years to people sometimes. I'll say, well, it's it's like, you know, you want steam, you have to put a lot of energy into boiling the water. Yeah. And then the steam happens. And right. it's like, you know, and, and it, it doesn't, doesn't happen until the water reaches 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right. you know, and there's nothing much happening until that point, and then all of a sudden there's a phase transition, and boom, you have and, boiling yeah, water, it's steam. Yeah, there it is, right. <laughs> and I think I totally agree with you. I think it is, without those 20 years, I wouldn't have been able to understand that quote at the at the level that, that I did. Yeah, no, it's good to hear you say that, because there's some teachers who meditate for 20 or 30 years and do practices and whatnot, then they get awakened. Or, and then they all t- they tell all their followers, you don't need to do all that stuff. You know, you just get awakened, and, and it seems a little disingenuous or something to me. I I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so um, read that quote again, or say that quote again, because I didn't quite get it. Let's go through it a little bit more slowly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it says, uh, "Free, we are not the number one." What does that mean? The f- well, I got you. Need the next part. Okay. Good. The yeah. the, the, the first of all our objects. Mm-hmm. So freedom is not in identifying as this separate being. Right. One. Okay. Um, so free we are not the number one, the first of all our objects, but zero, mm-hmm. they're universal and absolute subject. So basically you, what you are, mm-hmm. and this is what I point to in from here to here more directly, mm-hmm. is you are the pure subjectivity of awareness meeting phenomenality Mm-hmm. And making you ultimately the experiencing of each moment, right? And ultimately, at least in my books and things, that is what I point to: that you are the experiencing of living. You are not the uh, false self, thinking you are this this separate entity outside of the chain of cause and effect that everything else in the universe is bound within. Then you somehow have this separate will and volition that nothing else does. You are completely bound, which is why I agree with what you said about had I not done all those other things, this quote wouldn't have had the effect it, it did. Because it's it's all this unwinding chain of cause and effect. And what you are, and again, in the way I describe it, is you are the experiencing of living within that unwinding chain of cause and effect. Mm-hmm. And while we don't know, while we certainly can't predict what's going to happen down the road or even in the next minute, um, it is the unwinding chain of cause and effect. Mm-hmm. And and we are a causative element in that. You know, I can pick up, I just, I literally just changed the world. You know, picking I picked up, up a pen. That, yeah. Picking up a pen. Right. But, you know, so we are causative, causative links in the chain and we do have the ability to 
have causes one way or the other affecting mm-hmm. other people and everything else in our lives. But, but you know, I am not uh, I am not playing in the NBA right now because I am you know not six foot t- six foot ten and dunking basketballs. Right, that's, right. You know, that's not what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so since this shift, and, uh, and, ju- and even right now, uh, when you refer to I, I'm not in the NBA, or I just picked up this pen, um, do you have a kind of a dual sense of that? You know, sir, yeah, I am the I who is picking up this book. And at the same, very same time, just as much so, if not more so, there's an aspect of who you are which does not pick up books or play basketball or anything else. There's, there's some kind of other dimension to what you are, which is... We could say more, si- which is silence, or which is, you know, uh, there's a level at which nothing is happening or has ever happened. Um, I, my, it, it, it's interesting because a lot of I get a lot of emails asking similar questions, and at least there, there's there's and this it's interesting having these conversations, right? Because I means you know, twelve different things, but you know, conventionally speaking, mm-hmm. when I'm having a conversation, I means this physical body pick that up but experientially and i actually think this is true for most people almost regardless of their spirituality most of the time they are they are the experiencing of living mm-hmm. they are not thinking i am picking up this pen right they are experience they are experiencing life and they're not really that self-identified until usually something negative happens or something yeah you know, they're just going through life ex- being the experiencing of living mm-hmm. and so I, th- I think most of the time Oh, you know, certainly more so because of my, you know, the path I went down. But in general, yes, I'm I'm more the experiencing living. And now, you know, because I do think, like speaking of you know spiritual teachers saying, you know, kind of, kind of going through all this work and then saying, oh well, you know, you don't have to do anything. Just you know, just be here now or or whatever. Um, what what I, what what I, sometimes you know, want to express to people is, is that, you know, it, it's, it's actually, you know, something you do most of the time. Mm-hmm. And I actually forget I, where I was going with the, with the teacher thought. So, maybe well, come. uh, yeah. So I, I guess I, what I'm trying to get at is your, your, how you're not, I don't want to use the term self concept because concept is, is the wrong word, but how you're, oh, sort well, of your self perception or self, how you, what you take yourself to be versus okay, what, so I, versus I, what you took yourself to be before this shift. Right. So I have a I, I drifted off from your question. So so when people ask me that a lot of them want to know if is it, is it peaceful, is it quiet, is it nothingness? Mm-hmm. And um my response is 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 no, it's kind of the opposite. It's it's more alive and more full and more vibrant mm-hmm. because I'm not I'm I'm embracing the the whole of of duality. Mm. It's I'm not and this is what I was going to say a minute ago was what I do think is a bit of a um Maybe well-intentioned um, con by by a lot of spiritual teachers is is a lot of them promise that you will if you do whatever they're telling you to do that you will get to experience one side of duality <laughs> that you get the you get one side you get all the good stuff and mm-hmm. you get nothing you know you don't have any of those negative and and honestly from my perception that that's that's not really valid I think that the 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 actuality of things is when you when you embrace it all, and there's there's not resistance to the negative or resistance to the positive, you get a, a fuller, more flowing experiencing of living. Yeah. And at least in my experiencing of things, that that's a more valid uh, description of, of of things. One of one of my my favorite cartoons that I can never find, uh, <laughs> that I saw 25 years ago somewhere, um, that I, I was in Santa Fe and I saw this cartoon, but um, it was. Uh, it was a, there's there's giant vat of soup, big giant vat of soup, mm-hmm. and uh, there's uh, standing with his back to the soup is a is a Buddhist, mm-hmm. because all all desire causes suffering. Right. And you don't e- you don't even want to, you know, kind of acknowledge that the the soup of life is going on mm. behind you, you know, and um, and then there's a there's a Taoist who is observing the soup. Mm-hmm. You know, he's watching the, the ebb and flow of, of life, and he's, he's, you know, he's not suffering, but he's, he's just observing it. And then there's the tantrika, 
who is in the soup with the ladle, <laughs> pouring the soup down his throat. <laughs> and even though Tantra in the West, I think, has been right. bastardized to just mean sex, right. I think ultimately being the Tantrika, the mm -hmm. mystic who embraces it all, is ultimately because because we're, we're here experiencing life. Yeah. And when you can embrace it all, then I think that's as the experiencing of living, then that naturally occurs as a as a separate entity with an illusionary uh, free will and volition outside of the chain of cause and effect. Then, in my experience, you suffer. And those are the the things I try to differentiate between. Hmm. Was there a caption on that cartoon, or you just kind of figured out who the people I, were? And... I don't quite. I don't quite remember. I think huh. it might have been on, you know, it was probably like on some men's room wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Santa Fe. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, it's ironic in a way because a lot of, almost any teacher you can name who came from the East uh, to the West ends up getting embroiled in some sort of scandal, you know, um, <laughs> which usually involves, you know, indulging in things that they ostensibly had given up. Um, and, uh, you know, had all those young sannyasins around, it's, it's, I guess it's tempting. Yeah. Or sannyasinis or whatever. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, um, so, you know, what you're saying is just sort of wholeheartedly live life and that's why we're here anyway. And uh, that's what we signed up for. Uh, so just, just do it. Um, and, 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 and in the attempt to avoid, you know, pain and, and and other you know and suffering yeah. to some extent i think you you miss out on a, on a lot of on a lot of fullness of living instead of going yeah i'm like in my uh in my from here to here book one of my favorite stories uh of all time i put in this book that and it's um basically is there's a, a master who is teaching to his students all the time that um life as 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 they perceive it is an illusion mm -hmm. And he goes on, you know, he's always teaching them. They're always trying to get what he's what he's saying. And one day while he's lecturing, a messenger comes in and uh, informs the master that uh, the master's son has just died. Mm. And the master begins to cry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they, you know, one of the students raises his hand and he says, but master, you've been lecturing to us for years that, you know, life as we perceive it is, is, an, is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And here you are crying. And he says... Yes, and there's no greater illusion than having your son die. Huh, interesting, yeah. So he's still feeling life. He's still alive. He hasn't numbed himself, you know, to the point where he's just, you know, a zombie walking down the street. He's he's fully present. Yeah. There's a, a story about Shankara, which I've told too many times in these interviews, but I'll tell it one more time, uh, <laughs> which is that um, he was um, going to visit some king, and the king wanted to test him. And you know who Shankara is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the king wanted to test him, so he released some wild elephant as Shankara was coming up the road. And, and the elephant was coming towards Shankara, and Shankara climbed up a tree to escape the elephant. And the king said, aha, big phony, you know. If the world is an illusion, why did you climb the tree? And Shankara said, the illusory elephant chased the illusory me up the illusory tree. <laughs> uh-huh. And, and, yeah, and, and, my, and the point in my, my book is, or from here to here, more precisely is is that uh, in, in my perception it, it's not that the world is an illusion mm -hmm. it's that the the way we perceive it is an illusion I mean it's as real as any as actually anything we know it's more real than anything we actually know mm -hmm. um, it's our experiencing of living but the way we perceive it again with with an illusion of this free will and volition that actually is not the case to me that is that is the illusion yeah. That we have that we have all this control that we don't actually have, and that is why we tend to suffer, because we we assume we should have more control than is actually possible, or we assume others should when it's not really an option. Mm -hmm. And so we're perceiving this world as a you know in in a sense that like maybe the way Byron Katie says it, where we walk around with all these shoulds that have nothing to this, just the actuality of what is. Yeah. And not only not only volition, but I mean even just perception. I mean, if I look at this book, 
I'm seeing paper and I'm seeing colors and I'm seeing this and that. But if we go down to the molecular level, it's something entirely different. If we go down to the atomic level, it's entirely different than that. And if we go to the uh -huh. subatomic level and so on. There's, it's mostly empty space with occasionally uh -huh. a little virtual uh -huh. particle kind of coming into existence and going uh -huh. out again. So, uh -huh. you know, there's, there's all these levels of, reality, levels of reality and we're kind of tuned into a particular section of the, the spectrum, well, so to speak. And Right, and we're but we're and we are we are very much tuned in, and I would say bound within the mostly the Newtonian, you know, world. And as I joke with you know, because there, there's a lot of New Age spiritual people who, in my perception, you know, like to ba bastardize quantum physics. Yeah, yeah. And oh well, you, you know, it's all we're all just quantum particles. And I'm like, okay, well, when that when that car's bumper is coming towards your kneecaps. Yeah. You may both be quantum particles, but in this Newtonian world, they're pretty densely packed, and you better get out of the way. Yeah, you know, because that's all well and good, but you know, this is the experiencing we're having on at this level. I once heard a physicist say that there's actually st mathematically a finite possibility that you know you could pass right through the car when that happens. But it, the, but you know it's, it's such a <laughs> such a small possibility that you better not practice. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, and that's my my you know I kind of joke. Well, yeah. go forth and you know <laughs> prove your point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also a finite possibility that all the air molecules in this room could rush up into the corner and and con right. you know congregate there. But you know mm -hmm. this in the real world, this stuff very seldom, if ever, happens. Right. You can't rely on it. Yeah, one in one of uh, what uh, you know one of. Some alternate universe, maybe that happened, but you know, yeah, not this one lately, anyway. Mm. Which may, I mean, if if cities are a valid phenomenon, then there are all sorts of historical records of people having performed them. Um, not too many contemporary ones, but anecdotal historical ones. Uh, you know, maybe those guys who performed them had, had gotten to a level at which they actually had some mastery over these more quantum mechanical levels. You know. Well, and, I'll, and, and I will uh, very respectfully uh -huh. uh, say that one of, again, I, I actually think um, point, pointing or emphasizing such stories mm -hmm. um, takes away from the actual miracle that is constantly happening each moment, which is you and I, never mind Skype, <laughs> but, but just the fact that you, you're, you're walking around experiencing living, that's the miracle. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and personally, and people may not like this, but personally, I, I don't believe human beings get to transcend the laws of physics. Uh, and I think there's, you know, there's lots of stories about people doing things, and that's all well and good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, I think usually they're... Um, there, there are stories. Yeah, but, you could know, be. A lot of, you know, I, not like, but yeah. I actually, I actually think it's a detriment sometimes to, to emphasize those things because it's pointing in the opposite direction of where you, or where the miracle is constantly happening. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, you know, my bias is that actually such things have happened, but who knows? You know, I mean, I, I I'm. Oh yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm, sure about anything. Yeah, no, and, and I get that, and I'm. Yeah. And, and I'm like you, I don't know. But and it's we not like they're violating the laws of physics. It's just that they're kind of, just as an airplane doesn't violate the laws of physics, it just sort of uses different laws or somehow masters subtler or, laws or some such thing. Or And I totally agree. I, and what I will often say is, look, I'm all for people doing things we can't explain. Yeah. Like, because there's plenty of things we can't explain. But if you say you can levitate and then they put you on a scale in a lab, and say go ahead, and you you can't do it. Then right. I don't think you're levitating. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And even if you, you know. even if you could, as you say, uh, there's something much more significant going on. Um, Which is you wake up every morning. Yeah, and you're having a life. And even for the person who supposedly can levitate, if they if there if if there is such a person, uh, there's something much more sumptuous, much more. Uh, significant than that that, in, that they're that they're living, I would say. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, I would say that the fact that they're, you know. Yeah, I mean, Michael Jordan through. could levitate more or less. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't actually jump higher; he just comes down slower than other people. It sure so. does look like it. No, yeah. I'm joking. I mean, yeah. yeah, I was thinking about Michael Jordan a few minutes ago because you were talking about um, somehow, you know, living so. F living so fully that and functioning so spontaneously that you weren't even 
aware of it. And, you know, athletes like that would get into a zone state. Slow. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. where they're, they're just kind of like, in a way, they're, they're not doing anything. They're, they, they have a sense. They, they, they mm-hmm. report having a sense that, that they're really just, you know, completely on autopilot. And, and it's all just, they're not interfering. They're not controlling. It's just happening so mm-hmm. spontaneously. But they're doing this miraculous stuff, you know, on the basketball mm-hmm. court or whatever. Yeah, I remember him saying one, seeing one interview with him where we talked about how, you know, the basketball hoop is like three times as big. Yeah. And you're just, you're just throwing this. It's so easy, you know, and then, you know, then, yeah. the, then the next game you don't have that. But it's nice when you, yeah. when those games come along. Now, if he came down and broke an ankle all of a sudden, then zoom, you know, the awareness kind of zooms right, right into right. the individual and there's, there's some mm-hmm. suffering and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or at least pain. A pain, and prob- yeah. And, and probably then some, probably some suffering because you're Michael Jordan and that's your that's whole your identity. Bread and right? butter, yeah. <laughs> but what I find is that actually when there is some kind of crisis like that, if I'm if I'm exhausted and running through an airport or if if I injure myself somehow, um, that's there. But it almost brings into greater contrast the the presence that that is there and that. Uh, I sort of buffers it or, or just, you know, mm-hmm. you, you dwell in that presence and find my ankle is killing me, but the presence is so predominant that, you know, on mm-hmm. some, on some level it doesn't really matter. You know, I can handle it. Right. You can. And I agree. Cause you're, and I, I think at some level there is that you're not, you, you are not the suffering, you know, you are not the, the, the lone entity, you know, in pain, you are more than that. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was getting at before when I tried to, Talk to, get you to say well what is your actual self perception now you know what is it like to be Gary uh, there's there's some dimension or something that is not perturbed by pain or by fatigue or by other things that happen mm-hmm. and, and it um, you know it, it's just uninfluenced by those things right right and I, and I think that is that that pure subjectivity of awareness that I sometimes talk about but without without phenomenality without meeting the world there is no experiencing so i I would i think makes my even from from here to here a little different is a lot of people in my perception stop at that place identifying as awareness and then they're observing the world yeah and personally i think which is a funny word um i I think the, the step after that is to realize that what you are is the you you're not one with everything. What you are is you are one with the everythingness of your experiencing in this continual this here now. Mm-hmm. So you're the everythingness of your experiencing. Yeah. That that you know, and that's that's a big, full, vibrant, alive thing to be. Yeah. Continually. I was a student of Marshi Mahesh Yogi for many years, and he used to like to talk about 200% of life, and he would say 100% inner spiritual, 100% outer material. And people would always think, okay, great, that means I can get enlightened and I can get rich. But, um, you know, I think what he really meant, ultimately, in a more kind of a profound sense, was, you know, what you're getting at here, which is that, you know, life is a, is a much bigger wholeness than just some inner subjective silence. There's, and if you, and if that's all you, if that's all you glom onto, then you're kind of shortchanging yourself. You know, you're, you're cutting out half the whole thing. And, oh, you know, yeah, you're missing all the juice. You yeah. Know? It's, and, and again, as, as the everythingness of experiencing this here now, you know, this, this personal everythingness, cause I don't know you're experiencing, but, with that as as what you are, mm-hmm. probably more than who you are, um, you know the, the 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 pain moves through, but it's it, it's pretty quickly, and the pleasure is is fuller, even though it moves along as well. You don't try to, mm-hmm. but it's just you know you 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 literally are just the experiencing of living, yeah. and and as you like, I actually don't think that um, I don't think the and this is again where I'm kind of particular with my words i try to be very precise especially and from here to here with with how i use my words but to me it's not it's not desiring that causes suffering it is the attachment to desiring yeah because because as human beings we we desire and we strive you don't you don't go from uh living in caves to landing on the moon by not being a species that strives right and i mean even if you're reaching for the salt shaker to season your food you know that's a desire. Mm-hmm. So it's the it's the in my perception it's the attachment to your desire that is what 
what ends up causing suffering. Because, right. uh, you know, if, if there's no salt, okay, then you get out. If you're attached to their, you needing salt, then you're going to suffer over over that attachment. So, yeah, but obviously you're saying uh, that you're never going to be free of desires if you're alive. You're going to have desires, you know. Um, you're going to want to eat. You're yeah. going to want to, you know. It, but it's the attachment to those desires. And some people, of course, manage to live a lifestyle in which they minimize their desires. But uh, but they but you know as as has often been said, you can be much more attached to a minimal set of desires sitting in a monastery than some guy who's you know living I, living the life out in the world and but is not attached to it. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I, I have, des you know, I, I desire to write these books, mm -hmm. so I sat down and I, I wrote them. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's just what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And if uh, for some reason it didn't work out, I would have found other things to do. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you can almost think of desire as, uh, uh, as the evolutionary impulse, you know. I agree. Channeling itself through your particular physiology, yes. your particular mind-body yeah. system. Right, and what I... To talk about again in both, I think both my books is is that, you know basically what people are is is the experiencing of their neurology and their conditioning up to that point in life meeting the present moment yeah and you are that experiencing and then if you you know have certain ex experiencings that you what would like to change maybe you you strive to change them and some mm -hmm. other ones you may not and you know i mean that's that's the mystery of the human condition is you never you never quite know when when you're gonna you know seek change or when it's gonna happen and that's yeah. kind of where all the fun is you and know that's where a lot of the fun is yeah absolutely and it's interesting to consider you know what is it that causes us to seek change or to strive to do this or whatever and I, you know again that phrase the evolutionary impulse i sort of get the feeling like there's this sort of universal force that gave rise to the universe and you know we are an expression of that force and that force is expressing itself through us um, you know we are that intelligence which gave rise to mm -hmm. this whole thing you know being reflected in or channeled through an individual expression we're kind mm -hmm. of like a sense organ of the infinite and uh, you know every desire great and small is mm -hmm. the impulse same impulse right. which gave rise to the universe reaching for the soul you know or, right. or writing a book or mm -hmm. you know, building a, a Saturn rocket and going to the moon, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just uh, yeah. And we're all a we're all, and all our these filters are all unique, mm -hmm. and you and I can be in the same room looking at the exact same object, and we're gonna have we're gonna be having different experiencings. Yeah, it's gonna you know I'm gonna be reminded of the the vase my mother had at home, and you're gonna be thinking of what flowers to buy to put in the vase for your mm -hmm. for your wife or whatever, and then that's that's the beauty of it all. Or we're watching Rush Limbaugh on TV, and I'm tearing my hair out, and you're saying go Rush. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, actually. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't watch Rush Limbaugh on TV, but <laughs> but, but even politics, it's it's, it's fascinating because you know you have you know. We'll, we'll, we'll take a select sample, but you have, you know, a, a group of, of good, good, well-meaning people on both sides of an mm -hmm. issue who see it completely differently. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so amusing. I have a little political mailing list, you know, and uh -huh. and uh, whenever there's some political article or something that really gets my goat, you know, I'll, s I'll send it out. And uh, I have one guy on the list who is very conservative, another guy who is very liberal, and they'll both come back at me, sometimes in the same fetching of the email, uh, one saying that Barack Obama is, is this liberal Marxist communist dude, and the other guy saying that Barack Obama is, you know, just another George Bush, you know, he's too, way too conservative, way far right. to the right. What's the difference? Yeah, and right. both guys are reacting to the very same thing. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. <laughs> that is the human condition, yeah. Yeah. So and it's 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 interesting to rem to remind oneself of that, you know, because I'm I mean I'm, I you know I vote a certain way, I have my political opinions and so on, but uh, if you can sort of keep this principle that we're discussing in mind, you just you can't get too steamed about anything. I mean, you you have to realize, and you know that there are so many perspectives, and no relative perspective can be absolutely right. You know, there's and always there's always going to be paradox. Right, and and George Bush, and Barack Obama, are are both meeting each moment with their genetics and their life conditioning up to that point in time, mm -hmm. and literally 
their their preconscious mechanisms in their brain are filtering all that information and to try to make it consistent with with what they've experienced in the past and and go through all this stuff and they literally get handed a perception mm-hmm. that you know then they make up you know they make a decision about but you literally get handed your perceptions you're not in control of how you perceive a situation and when you can at least i think i try to especially to my rabid political friends when when you try to point out that that is going on for for both sides uh you know both politicians you know they're just doing they're just doing what they do not only that but in the case of guys like that i mean they have put themselves in a position or gotten themselves into a position where the whole destiny of the nation is being filtered through their nervous system you know and the Mm -hmm. decisions they make are influencing seven billion Mm -hmm. people and mm-hmm. so, boy, talk about, you know, kind of being driven by forces larger than your individual perspective. Right, right. <laughs> but even then, even even that, it's it's how your how this neurology that has experienced life up to that point in time is, yeah. is you know, is able to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. And, and, you know, it's a, it's it to me, it's a little freeing. You know, I mean, I was an economics major in, in college, so I have definite opinions on economics. And but I'm like, well. You know, they're they're doing what they do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're not. My phone is not ringing. They're not <laughs> asking for my opinion. So. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should take over for Geithner or something. Well, we'll we'll leave we'll leave all that alone for yeah. now. But yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so why did you entitle your book "From Here to Here"? What's the significance of that title? Uh, be, because my my point in uh, basically the whole book is is the the way to awakening is 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 primarily through seeing through what is not and by seeing through the illusion of what is not what you can what you perceive to be real that is really an illusion if you can see through that then you are left as the experiencing of this here now which is what you have al- always already been you know so are you all- talking about a neti neti sort of thing uh, yes yes yeah. basically but it, but it's when you can see through humanity's primary illusion mm-hmm. which is the illusion of of conscious will you are left as the the experiencing of living and again the reason it's from here to here is cuz it's what you've always already been doing you just need to see through the illusion that yeah. that that was isn't what you've been doing cuz that the illusion and it's a very enticing one uh, it's a very appealing one and it's it's humanity's you know most prized possession which is why no one wants to give it up. Uh, but when you can see through that illusion, the more you can basically have more compassion for yourself and more compassion for others as, as you move through the world. And, and it's, you know, always already the case. Whether you see it or not is only, you know, my, my, I sometimes joke with people who email me that, you know, when you can open your eyes wide enough to see that everyone in the world is already enlightened, <clears throat> Then you get to inc- include yourself in that category. Mm. Um, uh, just, just as you were talking, I looked up a T.S. Eliot quote on the internet. From, it's from Burnt Norton. He said, "We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time." I yep, I, I agree, <laughs> I, and that's that's basically what from here to here is. It's like, look, this is what's going. This is the actuality of what is going on, and. Here's your illusion of what's going on, and mm-hmm. if you can see through that, suddenly you are left as the experiencing of of the everythingness of this moment, which is non-dual, because it's the whole thing. It's not just one side of duality. Mm-hmm. I'm not promising you that if you meditate, you know, this many hours for this many years, then you'll just you'll only get the dessert. You know, you won't have to eat your vegetables, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> huh. Which may, you know. <clears throat> may or may not be appealing to to some people but you know that um there's an old i've told this joke so many times on these interviews but it's been quite a few months since i told it who is the guy jeez i'll remember his name in a minute but he said he, he broke up with his girlfriend because he wasn't really into meditation and she wasn't really into being alive um, <laughs> Oh, God, very funny guy i forget his name um in any case you know what you're saying is obviously you know grab all the gusto you can get you know the whole enchilada is there to enjoy. Well, well, and and and, but also um, embracing the the actuality of the human condition is actually what is is what sets you free. Yeah, yeah. It, it is is, and this is where I, I, I sometimes also joke that you know if if you think it's complicated, you're looking in the wrong direction. Mm. 
it's actually very simple. And, and, and this is why, like, I don't, especially from here to here, I will occasionally get people emailing me say, well, why didn't you talk about quantum physics? And why didn't you go into that? And I'm like, well, because honestly, um, abstraction most of the time is just a distraction. Mm -hmm. And you want to abstract yourself into these, you know, wonderfully fuzzy ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. But the, the actuality, the, the, the simpleness of the actuality of what's going on is what will set you free. And it's it's why I mean it's fun to float out there and talk about how we're all quantum particles and everything. Mm. But you know, if you just understand the basics of of how your brain works and and kind of step back and look at life from really a common sense perspective of mm -hmm. well, God, I've wanted to change that about myself for 25 years and it still seems to be so. Maybe I don't consciously will how I am all the time. Mm. You know, now one of my jokes, which, which, uh, which I do like to use on people, and I, somehow, I think it was in a chapter that could edit it out of Past the Jelly, but um, it's, what's always funny to me is, is sometimes when, when something minor is bothering someone, mm -hmm. you know, and they're all, they're a little torqued about whatever's going on, and they think that some other person should just change, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that difficult. They, they should just be able to change. And I'm like, well, if change is so easy, why don't you just change so that doesn't bother you? Yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> if it's that simple, and then uh, suddenly it's like, well, well. <laughs> obviously, if, if you know, <laughs> although it may be impossible, it's a lot easier to change yourself than it is to change something yeah. at a distance, you know, which you have and, no. And, con and which brings me actually to an important point about from here to here, is another kind of main point of the book, which I think a lot of spiritual seekers may benefit from, mm -hmm. is that the way to change your experiencing of living in my per, in in my perception is to is to change your perception and then your experiencing changes a lot of people want to change their experiencing to then have a different perception mm -hmm. and i the, the whole point of the book is to to very simply and methodically walk you to a place where you're standing literally facing the opposite direction of where most spiritual books point you yeah. and going oh so I do not have all this conscious control over my experiencing of living. Maybe I am just left as the experiencing of living, and then you are free as that. So you kind of walk people through a, an intellectual process or a, a, a way of a way of sort of you know looking at their experience differently than they may have been. In order, yes. and do you find do you get reports from people who have read the book that in fact this has succeeded for them that they've really shifted. Uh, Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I get pe pe people love – I get emails from people going, this is the greatest book I've ever read. Cool. <laughs> and it's, which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, but, but I purposely hear all – it's from here to here. Uh-huh. But this book, then. I, pur I yeah. purposely – this was a 300-page book at one point. Wow. That I – because I purposely – because I, I honestly felt there were, everyone dances around this issue, mm -hmm. and no one just – concisely and precisely lays out the actuality of the human condition in a way that can set people free. Hmm. And and I do uh, there's some I have some optical illusion things in here to explain how your brain works and all these yeah. simple things but it's hmm. it's basically very simple science and common sense mm -hmm. of having people look at the actuality of what it is to be a human being and when you are you know I warn people in chapter 1 you know that you know this is about giving up your, you know, your the most prized of all human possessions, and mm -hmm. and I say once the, you know, once the roots of an illusion are exposed, you know, it changes things. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't doubt that this can have a major impact on people. Uh, this kind of thing. I mean, because you know, teachers we mentioned in this in this discussion, such as Byron Katie, Eckhart Tolle, you know, they're not really doing practices. There, or Byron Katie has her little process that she puts people uh -huh. through, but they're uh -huh. basically getting people to kind of look at things differently, you know, just sort yes. of shifting their perspective a little bit. And sometimes that has a radical effect. Yes. You know? No, and, then, and from here to here was definitely, again, it was meant to be an ice axe to yeah. break the, uh, the frozen illusion with, within the, the reader. And, uh, and, then from, and then past the jelly is a, meant to be a very humorous um, version of a similar thing. Yeah. But people laughing the whole, along the way because I also think humor is is a is a very valuable tool that is often 
missed right. in the spiritual seeking. You know, they get so serious. I'm like, well, you're just <laughs> you're just reinforcing your false self. Yeah. You know, so you know. Which one did you write that. first, Passagelli or? Here uh, here? I wrote from here to here first. Oh, okay. Then you thought uh, I better lighten up. So then you wrote this. <laughs> well, I, I I I genuinely I write when I have something to say. that I think will can add value. Right. And I I don't I. In in no way uh, meant to disrespect other authors, but I, I write when I think I have some a unique angle on things that can help people, and you I try not to say what everyone else is saying. If your books really took off, and you know you start getting invited to speak at big conferences and get paid a lot of money for it, and so on and so forth, would you just as soon do that as uh, you know do the body work and stuff you do, or? or um um, I like I, – I have a practice that is filled with uh, what I, I joke with my girlfriend is I, I get all the incurables. Mm -hmm. I get all the people who have been to everybody else. Yeah. And, and I do find it uh, for, for a certain type of uh, chronic structural pain mm -hmm. where something is not ripped off the bone or, or the bone isn't broken, right. uh, the work I do – is actually often very, very effective for people. So I do, I do find it rewarding, and I would yeah. probably – at least I'm under the illusion that I would continue to do some of that because I literally get people in my practice every week who've, who've been in horrible pain for 10, 20 yeah. years, and no one can help them. And sometimes I'm not doing performing any miracles, but my perspective on the body and the way I do things – a lot of times can set them free, and it's a it's a wonderful thing. Cool, yeah. So if you won the lottery, you'd probably still keep doing it if people came. Yeah, to and I and I'd probably still drive the same car I drive because I like my <laughs> like people. I would you buy? I'm like, well, I don't know. I kind of like my car. I don't huh. have to go buy a you know Ferrari, but <laughs> probably kill yourself if you did that. Um, <laughs> so what would you say? I mean, to somebody who is really beleaguered by life, they've they've lost their job, their house is getting foreclosed, their wife has breast cancer, their kids are rebelling. You know, um, everything's falling apart, uh, and you know they're really overwhelmed and you know feeling totally burned out. Or maybe you know an Iraq War veteran who comes home and has uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and is suicidal. I mean, people who are really beset uh -huh. by life's troubles. Do you do you feel like um, you and in your experience, have you been able to help people like that, or is your thing better, more suited for people who are kind of ripe to? Awaken, and they've already gotten rid of the the heavy load. Um, it's a, it's a little of both. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you know the the all the stuff you piled on uh, <laughs> some of these some of these poor people, but uh, for a lot of people, um, well, both books are, they're very freeing. Mm -hmm. uh, be, because again, you you I do think when you embrace the actuality of the human condition, and you you stop punishing yourself and other people for not having more conscious control over who and how they are, that frees up a lot of energy yeah. to to deal with your life. And then knowing that you you can still change, especially, you know, if you're a you know, a, a guy with PTSD, you know, there there's, you know, like uh there's emotional like there's things like emotional freedom techniques just to pick something out of a hat that I know is very, very effective that is profoundly simple and profoundly effective. Is that the thing with um, the tapping that people? It's do? the tapping. That, right. that basically, what it does is it it dilutes the the response that your brain has developed to certain situations, and it's it's profoundly effective. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what? So understanding that people can change, and to quote Winston Churchill, uh, you know, when you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. <laughs> you point. know, and and I encourage them to to ca keep casting the lines out. And, yeah. And, and I and honestly, be brutally, um, um, kind of honest with yourself whether something is working or not. Yeah. Because I do, you know, with whether it's a spiritual practice or with with when I'm help trying to fix somebody's body. I mean, it's funny. I get people in, you know, they've been to everybody and they're no one. They're back. They can't fix. Their, no one can fix their back or they have. The, and so they've done everything. And a mm -hmm. lot of times they go, well, I did such and such a therapy that I've, you know, maybe never even heard of. Mm -hmm. And 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 they'll go, you know, what do you think of that? I'm like, well, you know, did it did it work? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they will kind of think for a moment and they'll go, Well it was very subtle. Yeah. And I'll go, Well well that's fine. Did did it work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> did did your pain go away? Yeah. I'm it's great if it's subtle, as long as it your it worked. And they kinda of go, Well not, not really, or you know, or maybe yes, it did. But it's like, well, it either 
helped with your pain or it didn't. Right. And and whether you're you know, if you're going through hell and you're keeping going and you're casting out lines, trying to help yourself, if that lure and that location on the lake isn't working, paddle somewhere else and yeah. Cast out a different bait. That's a good attitude. I mean, so, you know, obviously you're not saying just read this book and you're, I mean, you're treating people all day. You don't just hand them a book when they come in the door. You're working on their bodies and stuff. No, and, and, and this is why I come to my, my thing a lot of times about the Newtonian world. Right. Because I get a lot of healer types who, with the very, very best of intentions, you know, they'll, people come to them and they'll go, oh, well, you, you know, you get a session with me and not only, you know, you'll get better gas mileage in your car. <laughs> You know, yeah. and, and, and they mean well. Yeah. But I try to be brutally honest. I'm like, look, if you have, you know, I had a woman today who came to me, and she had a, a neck that has been bugging her for years, and I, I did, I pulled all my rabbits out of my hat mm-hmm. over the last few weeks, and I would work on her, and she'd be good for half a day. That night she'd wake up, she'd have pain again. Yeah. And I said, I, I think you have a bone spur in your neck. Oh. Uh-huh. You need you need an X-ray, right? Because what I'm doing isn't working. Yeah. And she went. She she texted me today. She said I have a bone spur. Oh, you were right. What do you think I should do? I said I think you should have a surgeon take his little micro tools mm-hmm. and file that down, and you'll be so happy because your neck will not hurt anymore. Yeah. You didn't tell her. The, <laughs> you didn't tell her the bone spur was an illusion or anything, or that, or she that should... if you if she meditates enough, it'll go away. Right, or drinks green tea or whatever. Yeah. And if it worked, I'd be fine. But you know, you know, you go. They take those little micro tools. They do. You're in and out the same day, and the next yeah. morning your neck doesn't hurt. That's cool. I th- <laughs> if you didn't live in San Diego, I might have you take a look at mine actually, because I sit here and I look out the window at the birds and stuff, but I don't look this way so much, and so my neck get, gets a little weird from always looking to one side. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> and I, I will tell you if you just since we're doing everything here, yeah, right? Right. if you reach around to whatever side hurts, uh-huh. if you reach around and touch this side of your of your shoulder blade, uh-huh. that muscle is probably tight. Huh, even if it's up in the neck mainly that I seem to yeah, have see. Yeah, see, see, here's the secret with bodies. Uh-huh. Most of the 95% of the time, when it comes to chronic structural pain or inability to function, where it hurts is not why it hurts. Huh. Usually, if you if you think of your body. Uh, and all the muscles in your body, like the rigging on a big old sailboat. Yeah. <clears throat> um, when the bigger, stronger pieces of rigging get tight, they torque everything else, and mm. it's the little pieces that snap. Yeah, I see. Or cause discomfort. So most of the time, most necks I fix, I fix mm. by freeing all this stuff in their shoulder girdle, mm-hmm. including their pec minor and all this other stuff, because these things are torquing your shoulder blade. Mm. Your neck muscles attached to the top of your shoulder blade so your neck muscles get pulled on yeah. your neck hurts and can't function but it's all the big bullies down here that are tight that are that are huh. that are causing your pain so if you came to me i would free if you have a decent body i can try to find a body worker for you there but you know if you have somebody since this is on tape if you have somebody free your teres major and minor your subscapularis your infraspinatus your pec major and minor your your subclavius and your supraspinatus, your neck will stop hurting 98.32% huh. of the time. Cool. Well, <laughs> well it's, it's, I, don't consider it, I don't consider it kind of off the topic that we discussed that because, you know, what, what it illustrates is that, uh, you know, you're kind of an all possibilities kind of guy, and I like that. I mean, I like the fact that you don't compartmentalize life and, and sort of, um, you know, devalue any aspect of it, I, I think that's mm-hmm. real, real healthy, and it's it's a very spiritual teaching, really, that which mm-hmm. you've which you've said explicitly in this interview, but it bears you know emphasizing, um, because there are a lot of things out there which do that, you know, and there are a lot of there are a lot of teachers or practices which actually say you should only do this. You're off the program if you're if you're looking into this, that, or the other thing. Just stick with right. with us. We've got the whole package, but they don't have the whole package, you know, and and right. you know so. If, if people find something beneficial here or there, mm-hmm. great. Add it to the soup, and um, and even and even people who who love my books, or, or like from here to here, some people, you know, they 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 love. Them. They're like, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. What do I do? And I'm like, well, I mean, this was honestly for me, that that's everything. Yeah. But you, you know, if you if you're still go. Find things that you, that res, resonate with you. Yeah, you know, it, it just I don't know. See I don't what know attracts what you? Like I I love Wei Wu Wei. Mm-hmm. Wei Wu Wei is torture for most people. Huh. 
He's he's so he's he's a he's an Irish aristocrat right. who was who was who was trained in at Oxford and Cambridge. He's, he was fluent in Greek and Latin. Mm-hmm. When he when he didn't have the right word for something, he would just make up his own word from the <laughs> from the Latin and Greek roots. Yeah, and he's and most people are like yeah, that, I love him, but yeah. well, even that know. little quote you read from him, I had to have you interpret for me. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't no, understand and, what and, he was saying. And there's other things that people love that that. Uh, that you know they completely resonate with that don't do it for me and I don't need it to do it for me if it works for you then yeah. then all the all the better but I do want to say just on the bodywork thing what mm-hmm. what what is an interesting what was an interesting transition for me was I got into bodywork and I, I originally trained as a rolfer mm-hmm. at at the Rolf Institute and cuz rolfing has a big reputation for being able to you know change someone's body and you change their consciousness right and while I I while I do not think that's untrue. Mm-hmm. I, along the way, I reached a point where I felt like actually getting people out of pain allows them to not have their physical body be a distraction for them and they can then get on with their spiritual or consciousness pursuits. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. not so sure it's the vehicle, but boy, it sure is, can be a distraction. Sure. And if I can get that out of the way, you know, and people can go forth and have their you know, less painful experiencing of living than than I'm happy to do so. Yeah, I'm kind of reminded of Abraham Maslow's pyramid of needs. I mean, if you don't go to the Sudan and start teaching some lofty Vedanta, you give them some food, you know, and t- t- help right. them help them farm right. and get clean water and and all that stuff, you know. Right, and here's the here's the three stretches you need to do so that your neck doesn't hurt all day every day. Yeah, and then you can get on with your life. Mm-hmm. Cool. So uh, do you ever, aside from writing books, do you ever, like, give satsangs or go speak at conferences or, you know, that Not kind so of much. stuff? Not so much. I mean, they wanted me to, uh, my publisher was wondering if I wanted to go to the non-duality conference in, in uh, San Rafael this year. And, uh-huh. and I was kind of like, so, you know, what is it? She was like, well, it's a bunch of, a bunch of non-dual authors and people giving <laughs> lectures to each other. Yeah. And, you know, well, that's fine. I was kind of like... Well, I don't really need. I know I don't really need. To well, I imagine they're going to have an audience of people too, aside from just the authors. Yes. But I just thought it was kind of funny. I was huh. like, so at the moment, I I'm not opposed to it. I'm actually very comfortable talking with people, and but I don't seek it out. Yeah, uh, I bet you you could you could put together a, an interesting lecture because you could blend a lot of humor with a lot of sort of wisdom, and uh, and it would be quite entertaining. Yeah, no, it's not. It's it's not off the table. Yeah. Because sometimes I do think I if I, but I genuinely have to feel like I'm I'm giving people some value. Right. And I know a lot of people will say, well, just being there was is enough. And right. Just, but uh, but I'm more of you know I don't know I'm from New England. I'm like, well, what am I? Am I going to be giving them some good stuff? You know, if they're going to if they're if they're going to be coming here and sitting here, I gotta you know I gotta give them some 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 good material to to grind on as they're you know driving home at least yeah i'm from new england too i'm from i grew up in connecticut okay and mm-hmm. what, what part fairfield okay okay yeah, yeah so you you know yeah all i the... actually lived in providence for a while so you know <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> same part of the country yeah and uh, it leads to a lot of f- fun stories you yeah know, for uh, that new england upbringing so did you um when was this shift that took place when you had the we were reading Wei Wu Wei and you it was like a couple was, years ago or something or no it was getting I'm getting to be an old man I think it was uh, <laughs> it was five or six years ago oh I, man I, you, you're I ancient think, yeah I think November seventeenth or eighteenth okay it was one of those years you can pin I was it about thirty eight I kind of threw everything away uh huh and I was I think I was forty I think it was November seventeenth when huh. I remember kind of looking at the calendar going it was either the seventeenth or eight, the eighteenth yeah. So you're but, 45 or 6 now? Yes, 45. Huh, you're in pretty good shape. I mean, you look young. I figured you were like in your early 30s or something like that. No, mm. but, uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't drink a lot. I don't do a lot of drugs. Take care know? of yourself, right? <laughs> I, do, mm. I, I do, you know, I have a pretty physical job. Yeah, keeps so, you healthy. Uh, yeah. Now, in the, in the five or six years since this awakening took place or this shift or whatever you want to call it, um, have you experienced a continued... Um, deepening or clarification or refinement or some kind of progress in whatever way you'd want to define it um let less uh less slipping off uh center for lack of a better word i was uh-huh. a martial artist forever so right. um a, a little less like there's an old my old uh sensei up in 
Northern California used to say, you know, and not to not to label myself a master because mm -hmm. uh, I actually think everybody's already doing this. I'm just trying to show them yeah. what already is. But he says, you know, it's not that the master doesn't get off center. It's just that he gets off center, you know, and regains his center so quickly that nobody notices. And, yeah, uh, you know, point. and I will be the first to say that my girlfriend does notice because I do get off center. And, right. um, but because to me, it, it is. If you're so enlightened, why did you do that? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, but but the, for, for me, it's 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 more that you're just a little more, you know, stuff happens and you have, like when you were saying, you're at the airport, you haven't eaten, you haven't slept well in three nights. You know, you're a little less, you know, sometimes it's a little, yeah. you know, you're not in that 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 space of I am the everything that's quite, quite as readily. Right. And so for me, it is it is the, the ebb and flow. So you uh, could say it's that. getting more stabilized, more kind of integrated or something. Yeah, more, more stabilized. But I also think, and, I, and again, I'm perfectly willing to say that, and this is just where my experiencing is right now. Maybe it'll change, but um, but I'm not sure it ever changes. I'm not. I, I I do thank you, like the master crying when his son died. I'm like, well, yeah. If you're if you're open to the experiencing of everythingness, you're you're going to cry and you're going to have yeah. days where it's not you know it's not the wonderfulness of experiencing living that a lot of people you know promise as the perpetual e-ticket, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, because I bought a lot of those tickets. Right. So that's that's my joke. It's like, well, I, you know, I bought a lot of those tickets. So I don't know. I, I kind of pay. I have the right to, to to say that. I think at this point. There's a there's a saying in uh, in the Indian literature where uh, they talk they're talking about impressions uh, and how they impact different nervous systems. And you know, one nervous system would be like stone, and you make an impression, it etches in, and it just doesn't go away. You come back ten years later, you still see the impression. Another, uh -huh. another will be more like sand. You know, you make the impression might be there f until the tide comes in, and then it's washed. Another will be more like water. You know, it's almost instantaneous. And uh, another like air. You don't even hardly see any impression made. And uh, so this like thing, it. this thing you said about the master, you know, uh -huh. sure he gets, he maybe he gets perturbed, but he comes back more quickly. Uh -huh. So he's he's more like the line in air, you know, uh -huh. or the uh -huh. line in, the line in water. Uh -huh. That's very nice. I like that. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. Um, and I think there are, you know, probably studies could be done and have been done perhaps on some kinds of meditation techniques or whatever which explain that in some physiological detail. Like what's actually going on in your nervous system or in, in your brain or anything which, ca which allows you to, um, you know, uh, experience deeply but not, mm -hmm. but not be kind of permanently, you know, etched by mm -hmm. it. And a lot of it is... is just your little, a little gland called your amygdala, huh. you know, and that that is what gives you your immediate uh, pre-conscious impression uh, emotionally of a situation, mm. and and this is like a lot of PTSD guys. That thing is, you know, their amygdala is just hair trigger. You know, anything goes wrong, and they're, you know, it's 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 firing the fight or flight response. Right. And I do think, and and what a lot of meditation does and things is they. They allow that to to relax a bit, and and I, I do think not having and in from here to here I do talk about if you're um, I do talk about how you know when you're in utero you know your your body is being built uh, to to cope with the environment you're going to enter into, and mm -hmm. if your mother is really really stressed or uh, you know a meth addict or something else. Mm -hmm. You can, you will often develop a very, very sensitive amygdala. Yeah. And you, you come into this world with basically a hyperactive, uh, hyper vigilant way of going through the world. And that person would take a, you know, the, to the, you know, the, the Woody Allen movie character. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to take a lot, lot, lot more work um, to get that to mellow out than the person that comes in with a pretty balanced. Amygdala, whose mom, you know, listened to classical music and yeah. wasn't stressed, and you know, was was living in the countryside. You know, it's a, it's a different thing. Yeah. Or or your genetics, you know, you could inherit a, a an amygdala through your gene pool that's either very mellow and easygoing or very, you know, hyper vigilant. Yeah, there's something in the Bible which is something like the sins of the fathers are inherited. Seven by generations. The, yeah. Seven generations. Yeah. I, I really think there's something to that. In fact, I live in a community where, um, you know, of Maybe ten, eleven thousand people live here, and about three or four thousand meditate regularly. And uh, you know, there are all these kids that have been born to parents who've been meditating for decades. 
And uh, some of these kids are pretty remarkable, you know, really, really special. And then they're having kids now, you know, another generation <laughs> coming along. And so there's these uh, really special souls with nervous systems, which, um, you know, I, I would envy if I were an envious person comp mm -hmm. compared, compared to what I went through when I was a kid. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing when people, when you, when, when you realize that, you know, how the mom is, you know, affects how that, and I know people understand that, but to really understand literally the way your brain is being put together while the stress hormones or lack of stress hormones are pumping through her blood affects the way you come out. Yeah, very much so. Huh. Well, that would be kind of a weird note to end on. What are, is, there anything, <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that, uh, you know, I always say this towards the end of an interview, is there anything that, you know, you like to talk about or, th or say to people that I haven't thought to ask a question, you know, to elicit from you? Um, I would, uh, I would request or uh, suggest that people not under, underestimate the power of levity and a and a sense of humor mm -hmm. in their spiritual practice, mm -hmm. because I do think a uh, a lot of times uh, that that is 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 a big uh, master key that that is missing, yeah. because the the overly stern. The, I, you know, the, the earnest spiritual seeker is wonderful. The stern and overly serious spiritual seeker, I think, is, they're just why they're, they're they're chasing their own tail, and and it's until they lighten up, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, because that to me is just a sign that they're they're over identified with their with their false self. Yeah. And so. And um, actually, you can you can read stuff. I mean, there's Swami Beyond Ananda. You know, remember that uh -huh. guy. And, uh -huh. uh, and your book, I think, is, is very funny. And there are, you know, sources of actual – I mean, you can always just watch a good Jim Carrey movie, but there are also uh -huh. pl plenty of sources of actual spiritual literature that uh -huh. are, you know, act that are inherently funny. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and my stuff's different than, than Swami Beyond Ananda, but, but it, it does, you know, if, 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 if you're laughing – a bit at the human condition, whether it's Groucho Marx mm -hmm. or pa my book, Past the Jelly, or whatever. I, I think you you tend to be a little bit uh, healthier and probably a little uh, maybe deep in your spirituality a little bit because because yeah. uh, you you've, you've embraced the actuality of what is a bit. So and, that though, let's see if we can end by trading spiritual jokes. Okay, I've got one for okay. you. Okay. Um, so this guy goes to hell, and the devil is showing him around, and. Uh, you know, he's, it's, it's hell, it's a pretty bad scene. But then he, he sees this really gorgeous woman sitting on the lap of this 94-year-old geezer. And he says to the devil, he says, hey, you know, that doesn't look like hell to me. And the devil says, it is for her. <laughs> it's all relative. Very nice. Well, let's see, a joke. You're putting me under joke pressure uh, right on the spot. So I'll tell you what. I'll tell you a, a true story. Okay, good. Not even a joke. So uh, do you know Eslin Institute? Sure. Okay, well, um, a friend of a friend mm -hmm. uh, uh, up at Eslin, uh, 20, I'm, again, I'm getting old, so 25, 30 years ago at this point, um, was a, a very, very serious meditator. Mm -hmm. And you know she was she was getting up at four a m and putting in her hour or two, and then she was getting in another couple hours you know in the evening or in the afternoon when she had a chance and and she'd been at it for for ten twelve years, and she just couldn't break through to that next level and so she heard that uh, up at tasahara the uh the Buddhist uh monastery up in the mountains uh in the middle of California that there was a monk who just gave the the perfect mantras that could break you through. Um, you know, when you were in a stuck place. And so she gets in her little Volkswagen bug and she, you know, grinds her way up the, the mountain and she gets to Tassahara and she goes and she knocks on the monk's door and, and he has her come in and he sits down and he, she, she, you know, he, he talks to her and she tells him how, you know, she's really been serious and she's been dedicated and she's been going and, and she just really needs, the, you know, the seed to, to break him through. And he's like, okay, okay. Um, he says, I, ha I have your mantra. He says, um, he says, but here's here's how it's going to go. He says, over, you know, outside my house to the left, there's a little meditation hut, and I'm going to give you your mantra, and then, you know, immediately I want you to get up and I want you to go sit in uh, in in that hut uh, until you either get the essence of the mantra or for 24 hours of straight meditation. You know, if 24 hours pass, you don't get it. You come talk to me. So he goes, here here's how the mantra goes. He goes, um, 
you have to say the first part very strong. He says, sin. You know, and she goes, sin. And he goes, okay, good, good, good. She says, and he says the next part is very soft. He says, he says, says sa. He goes, she goes, sa. He goes, very good. He goes, the next part again, strong, you know, but deep. She says, he goes, yum. She goes, yum. And then he says it again. This is the last part, very soft. Ah, ah. So she does it. So she goes out. So she goes out. And she sits in lotus position in the meditation shack for 14 hours uh -huh. until she goes, Sen, Sa, Yuma, Sen, Sa, Yuma, sense of humor, sense of humor. She gets up, she gets in her car, she drives back to us, and she doesn't meditate for 15 years. So angry, man! All what he, she needed a sense of humor, and huh. she still didn't get it. But <laughs> so this is a true story, supposedly. That's great. <laughs> I like to think it's true. That's really good. <laughs> but um, anyway, so that's good one. My, that's my well, joke. Well, thanks. Anyway. Well, so, this has been great. I yeah. Probably, so yeah. Um, so let me tell you what's going to happen with this. Um, I will <clears throat> within. 24 hours or so, I'll probably have the audio of this on my website, which is batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which stands for Buddha at the gas pump. And, oh. uh, and then maybe within a week or so later, we'll have the video up. And then the video will be there, and it will also be on YouTube. And if you have a Facebook page, I'll also upload it to Facebook and tag you in it. So if people actually go to your Facebook page and look under videos, they'll see this there. Okay, I do have, I have a fan page. So. Yeah, and then okay. since uh, since uh, it'll be on YouTube, you can take it and embed it and put it on your website and stuff. Oh, very, nice. Um, very nice. So, and it's also a podcast that people can listen to on their iPods and so on. So it's kind of multi-purposed. Um, okay, fantastic. But, but there on the website of uh, batgap.com, we'll have uh, you can send me a little bio that you'd like me to put there and links okay. links to you know where to get your books and and stuff like that. Okay. And it's mostly Amazon's the easiest. Yeah, okay. And we can just link to the Amazon pages yeah. for, for those and books. They can order it into any bookstore, but Amazon's usually yeah. the way to go. So. Yep, they're, and the, I one, will, they're uh, the ones who are putting all the bookstores out of order. Shall I mail you? Yeah, that'd be great. I'll read it. I'm inspired okay. now to read it. Okay. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, Especially you know. since it's so thin. <laughs> Yeah, no, and people, the nice thing about, well, both my books, I'm always complimented, people tell me they read it more than once. Yeah. Uh, but from here to here especially, what one added benefit that I didn't quite realize mm -hmm. was that because it's, you know, 100 pages with pictures, right. um, people will right read it more it. than multiple times. Yeah. And I, and I think if it was thicker, they wouldn't. No, I'm, so I'm in the middle of um, a book called Halfway Up the Mountain by Mariana Kaplan. The, the subtitle mm -hmm. is The Error of Premature Claims to Enlightenment. And uh, I'm loving the book, but it's like almost 600 pages, and it just takes me months to go through a book. It's that. a mountain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, thank you. This has been fantastic. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. So uh, just to conclude, uh, you know, I, my name is Rick Archer. I've been speaking um, with Gary Crowley. Um, and uh, there will be, if you would like to ask Gary questions, um, his website is GaryCrowley.com, right? And uh, yes. there will also be a place on, on Buddha at the Gas Pump where if you pose questions, I uh, want to have a little discussion about things, I'll tell Gary that they're there. He can come in and answer them oh. and so on. Absolutely. And, uh, and that's the deal. So thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you next week with whomever I'm going to be interviewing then. Uh, so thanks.